I'm going to use two passages from the book of Ephesians as main text this morning. But I want to read something as I was pondering and just praying over this time together. So this is try number three of getting this message out. Um, but I believe with all my heart it's something that the Lord wants us to hear. So I'm going to share it. When I was pondering this, I wrote this down yesterday and I felt like I wrote it better than I could say it. So I just want to read this part. From Satan's perspective, as the God of this world, which Paul calls him, the ruler of this world, Jesus called him twice, the day of Pentecost must have been like an atomic bomb dropped on his headquarters. Up until then, the small group of sincere but weak followers of Jesus had been manageable. But at Pentecost, they were all clothed with power from heaven by the Holy Spirit, and immediately they began decimating and depopulating the kingdom of darkness. On the very first day, 3,000 souls were rescued and bowed their knee to Jesus as their new king. Of course, Satan didn't take this lightly, and he immediately began to develop a plan to sabotage and to weaken what the Lord was doing in this new band of spirit-filled humanity. The Lord is doing something in our midst, and the enemy would love to sabotage it. But, you know, here's the thing about Satan. He doesn't have a new playbook. He uses the same old playbook every time. There are attacks from without. So you see this in the book of Acts. This, this is Satan already showing his cards and his playbook of how he's going to work to try to disable. When there's a group of people that are one together and are focused on the Lord Jesus and are filled with the Holy Spirit and are committed to obedience to whatever he tells them to do and have released everything that they've been holding on to except for him, that group of people is powerful and unstoppable from the enemy. He might throw up roadblocks. He might throw up hindrances. He might throw up attacks, but he cannot stop that group of people. But he can derail them if they break apart, become discordant with each other, become divided, become offended with each other. He can break them apart and neuter their power that they carry, which he knows will always win over the power of darkness. The church of Jesus is his answer to what he wants to bring of his kingdom into this world. The enemy knows that very well. And his plan is intimidation and fear. So he's going to cause authorities, whether they be governmental or religious, to come after you, put you in jail, threaten you. Don't ever preach or teach in that name again. We're going to throw you in jail in Acts chapter Three and four. In Acts chapter 12, Herod had James beheaded. Death. External intimidation and fear. That's part of his playbook. You see that in countries today like China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, North Korea. There's that kind of fear tactics where it's intimidation. We're going to burn your house down. We're going to kill you. We're going to put you in prison forever. But you know, that is usually not that effective because as one of the early church fathers said, the the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church and it just causes it to grow and to expand. And so persecution doesn't always work. Sometimes it works a little bit. But the most insidious way and the most effective way that the devil tries to stop what God is doing in his people is from the inside. So in Acts chapter 5, you have the devil introducing pride and deception into the church. So Ananias and Sapphira, who obviously were well known to the apostles, so we have to assume that they were genuine believers. At least everybody thought they were. They wouldn't have been known by name to Peter and the rest of the apostles if they had not have made a profession of faith and been baptized and followed along with the protocol. But there was something, and Peter said, Satan has filled your heart to Ananias. 
Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So deception comes in on the wings of pride because Ananias and Sapphira saw that Barnabas, real name was Joseph, had sold a piece of land and came and delivered it to the apostle and said, here, everything that I have belongs to Jesus. Take this and sell it and give it to the poor. And that was awesome. And I think everybody was like, man, Barnabas, that's really awesome. And Ananias in his heart and Sapphira are like, we want people to applaud for us like that. So we have this piece of property, but if it's worth 40000 let's go and tell them that we sold it for twenty-five, and keep the 15000 just for future. And so that's what happened. Deception and pride coming inside of the body creates a culture where the God of truth is repelled. The whole image thing of I want to look good in the eyes of people, the whole fear of man thing is actually a hindrance to what God wants to do in his people. Every time pride enters in, it causes the spirit of love, of truth, of humility, and of the gospel to be suppressed and pushed down. But the Lord exposed the deception which in His mercy, He will dispose the deception in us and the pride that's in our heart. How many have had the Lord expose pride in your heart? How many, He usually does it through other people? (laughs) This is the beauty of community because people around you tweak you and they poke you right in the pride. How many have been poked right in the pride? (laughs) I have a lot of times. And I honestly, I've learned to thank God. Lord, thank you. I feel that, that tweaking. And I want to say something really bad right now. (laughs) But I know that this is you tweaking my heart. Because you see in me seeds of Ananias. And those seeds will not grow here. They have no place here. So I'm going to expose the seeds of Ananias in me to the light and get them out. Before they have a chance to grow in the community. So fear of man has to go. The whole image thing of you're awesome. And my question is always compared to what? (laughs) Not compared to Jesus. You're awesome, really? Probably not. We love you. We're greatly loved, but we're not great. Come on, y'all. We need to own that. The great one is Jesus. He has loved us greatly. He has rescued us, and he's conforming us into his image. But for us to say, in comparison to where we are going and where we will be when we see him face to face, we're not really awesome. I know we use phrases, and we're we're meaning well when we say that to people and all of that. I I don't, if you tell me I'm awesome, like, I'm not going to get all upset about it, so... So there's that. But here's what I want to speak about today. This is the third strategy in Satan's playbook. I think he only really has three. One is the external fear and intimidation. Two are interior. One is based on the pride, the image thing, like with Ananias, the fear of man, the desire for the praise of man. All of that stuff is our doorways to invite evil in and to repel the spirit of the living God. But Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 4, where we're going to read some passages, this, this is the one that I think gets us a lot. This is the strategy of the devil of offense and division. He causes relational offense. We get offended at things. And then he causes division and separation and relationship. And the Lord desires for us and commands for us to be one. This is not a suggestion. The Lord doesn't say in Scripture, if you all will be one, it'll actually be better and you'll get up to 80% instead of 60. He doesn't say that. He commands us to guard the unity of the Spirit. 
as it says in Ephesians 4. But let's start in Ephesians chapter 2, and let me look at these verses with you. We're going to read verses 11 through 17, and I want you to see in this passage that Jesus died for oneness in his body, and it's miraculous. Verse 11 of Ephesians 2 says, Therefore remember that formerly you Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. So he's talking about the Gentiles and the Jews, right? Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's who we were. Most of us in here are Gentiles. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Notice the word peace. It's in this passage three different times. It is the core thought here. He himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Now, in the New Testament, peace can mean a sense of tranquility and security and confidence inside of us, but it usually doesn't. Most of the time when the word peace is used in the New Testament, it's talking about relational peace, where we're one with each other. Peace with God means that we have been reconciled to Him, and there's no more hostility. There's no more tension. Now we're one. We're in unity together with God. That's what Jesus did. He took our sins, and He took away the enmity and the judgment of God that was rightly ours. Jesus came and he made peace between the Jews and the Gentiles. Let me suggest to you that the animosity between the Jews and the Gentiles was far greater than any animosity between blacks and whites in America ever, by far. I grew up in a lot of places, but I lived in one place outside of Los Angeles, and we lived a mile from um, an oil refinery. Standard oil in those days. And there were race riots in Los Angeles when I was a boy living there. And the Black Panthers had threatened to blow up that oil refinery in El Segundo, California, where I lived. And we only lived a mile from it, so that wasn't a good thing. So I remember during that time, my grandfather, who had been um, a veteran of both world wars, drove up to our house with his... Chevy Impala, opening up the back, I'll never forget this, opening up his back trunk, and it's full of guns and ammunition. Grandpa, where'd you get all that stuff? <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> and they were going to get up on the, on the buildings, you know, around the area. I mean, it was serious stuff. I remember we went... And there was a builder in our community who had built his house, and he built a bomb shelter underneath it. Because this was in the days of the Red Scare where everybody thought the Russians were going to bomb us with nukes. And so he had literally built a bomb shelter on his house. And my brothers and I and my mother went there, and we spent the night there in their bomb shelter. These are the kind of things that mark little boys. First the guns, and then the bomb shelter. Man, this is a fun night. And um, no, nothing really ever came of it because... It was kind of well-known. It was, it was more of a, a bluff. But there was a lot of tension. I've been around a lot of racial tension. But I can tell you, if you do any reading, the, the tension between the Jewish people and the Gentiles was in every sphere. It was racial. It was political. It was religious. It was social. It was everywhere. They despised each other. They hated each other, and Jesus said, this is going to be the test of my sacrifice, that I can take these people that actually despise and hate each other, and I'm going to bring them together in one body, and they're going to love each other with a supernatural love, and it's going to demonstrate the power of what I can do in the human heart. And he's done it, and he's doing it, and he's doing it amongst us, even with our differences 
They're not nearly as great as the initial Jew and Gentile divide. Like this almost destroyed the early church. Read the book of Acts. They're trying to figure out what are we going to do? Like the Gentiles are out there making sacrifices of all these animals and they're drinking blood and they're eating. The Jews are like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. It's like that, bad. What are we going to do? And so they go, Holy Spirit, what do we do? And Acts chapter 15, if you know that conference that they had, James is there and they're trying to figure out, Holy Spirit, what do we do? How are we going to create unity here? The Jews want the Gentiles to come and be circumcised and to follow the Mosaic rituals or they're not going to have anything to do with them. They're unclean. We're not going to touch them. They can't come in my house. And the Gentiles are like, dude, these, these Jews are crazy. We're not going to stop eating what we've been eating. We're not going to stop doing all the things we've been doing. And so they decided it would seem good to them and to the Holy Spirit was not to make 10,000 rules for everybody to follow, but to try to follow the rule and the law of love and of preferring somebody above myself. So one of the things in Acts 15 that I find remarkable, because Jesus had already declared all foods clean, right? In Scripture. And there's nothing that's unclean in itself, although to the Jews that was a taboo thing. But he, they put in there, look, Gentiles, here's what you can't do. You can't keep committing fornication and having sexual impurity. That's out. That's not okay. And, and another thing that you can't do is you can't drink the blood. Why was that? Not because that was an ultimate divine command, but because for the Jews, that was a deal breaker. If I see you in there eating that red meat, I'm going to vomit all over you. You're not going to come in my house. We cannot have fellowship. And they, by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, tried to navigate, how are we going to walk in love? And, okay, Gentiles, you deny yourself these things. And the Jews, you deny yourself these things because the important thing is not that we get our way. The important thing is that he gets his way. And that in the midst of our relationship, the power of Christ to change and transform hearts is actually put on display to the world where they go, Jews and Gentiles are loving each other. What in the world has happened? This is a miracle. That's what Jesus did. And that's what he does. And he's doing that even in the heart of the Father. He's doing that in every body of believers because the enemy's playbook is always the same. He's coming to try to produce a fence inside of hearts in order to create division where he has died for oneness and unity. And our slogan here at Heart of the Father is giving God what he wants. And I want to tell you more times than we're comfortable with, what he wants is for us to go low, to humble ourselves, and to love really well. So that the unity of the Spirit can be preserved. Thank you all for not looking at your watches. Okay. Verse 14, again. He himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. Listen to that phrase. It's so powerful. By abolishing in his flesh. When he went to the cross and died and was crucified, one of the things that happened, not the only thing, but one of the things that happened was the power of hatred and relational enmity was broken for those who would come to him. Which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. There it is again. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. By it having put to death the enmity. There it is again. Listen. One of the things that Jesus accomplished at the cross was that he put to death. He destroyed the enmity in relationships. The offense of people being different than me or doing things that I don't like. Verse 17. Here we go. The third time of peace. And he came. 
and preach peace to you who were far away. That's us Gentiles. And peace to those who were near. That's the Jews. Jesus is still preaching peace. Peace means oneness. Peace means unity. And I pray that as we go through some of these verses of Scripture today, that the Holy Spirit will actually prick your heart in areas where there might be offense and there might be division. And let the power of His cross. We, we, we want to give Him the reward of His suffering. Right? Right? And we say, we're often thinking of souls, which I agree. But one of the rewards of His suffering, it says right here, is that His people would be one and love each other in a way that makes the world stand back and take notice. That's one of the reasons that He suffered and died. Absolutely so. All right, flip over to chapter 4 of Ephesians. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 here. There's a mindset that the New Testament letters over and over and over again call us to as believers. Verse 1 of chapter 4 of Ephesians, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, I'm begging you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Now, if we put a hard stop right there, what would you say those reasons are going to be? And if, since you already read the verses, you already know. But you wouldn't think that it was going to be verse 2. This is how we walk worthy of the calling with which we've been called. With all humility. Y'all. I love when God moves in power. I've got tons of stories. I love it. But that's not what he said is working, is walking worthy of his calling. The first thing on the list of walking worthy of Jesus is to walk with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another. That means putting up with each other. In love. This is how we're walking worthy. Being diligent. Verse 3. Being diligent to preserve. Probably better translation. Many translations translate that as guard. This verb. To, to preserve. The, the noun form of it in the Greek is, is actually the word for a prison warden. We, we, we have to guard the unity of the Spirit. Jesus purchased it at the cross, but He commands us to guard it and to protect it and to make sure that it doesn't escape. Being diligent, that means effort and focus to guard the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Here comes that word again. It's talking about relational oneness. There is one body and one spirit, just also as you were called in one hope of your calling. This is a mindset. When the Bible says that they were all of one mind and one accord, I want to tell you, it didn't mean they agreed on everything. It didn't mean they all had the same opinions about everything. It didn't mean they all had the same preferences about anything. Far from that. It meant the mindset that we're supposed to have is Philippians chapter 2 is one of those places have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he did what? He emptied himself. That means my preferences, my desires, my opinions have to be subjugated to love. Every one of them. Now, I'm a person of strong opinions. I have a lot of biblical opinions that are very strong. But they cannot ever. I'm not talking about throwing out biblical truth now. You understand. I'm talking about opinions and preferences. My opinions and preferences have to be subjugated to the law of love and peace. So, in this room, 
and in this community, we have a lots of different flavors. We've come from different places. Theologically, we've listened to different teachers. We've read different books. We have different emphases. We have different things that resonate with us more than other things. There's some people that are passionate about the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. And I have good friends who like to wear a yarmulke on their head and sing in minor keys Jewish songs. And I've been to lamb concerts, if you all know lamb. Um, dancing around in the Jewish circles like that, it was a blast. Great. I was in New York City. But there are people that are passionate about the Jewish Jews. You have to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. What are you doing? Like you're second class if you don't keep that. Here's the thing. That's great. But those opinions cannot be a litmus test that divide me from my brother in Christ. Things that are not the command of Jesus are not the demand of you. So I have a litmus test that if you don't love Jewish roots like I do, then we can't really fellowship with each other. It's not okay with the Lord. Praise God that you love the Jewish roots. I'm going to learn and glean from you. And I have this many books on Jewish roots in my, in my library. So it's a real thing. I think it's interesting and it's fascinating. But I don't see the mandate for it in the New Testament. And I agree with Dr. Michael Brown. He says, who is a Jew? Who says... Once you start saying you should, you've crossed the line. You should hold the same opinion that I do and the same preference as I do that you crossed the line then. Peace is really important to Jesus because he died for peace and he preaches peace. He still preaches it by his spirit in our midst. So, we have to guard. I want to read you this quote by Art Katz. Art Katz is... Um, he's with Jesus now, so I'm sure he's more enlightened. Um, But this is really powerful. I think this is very prophetic for our day. Here's what he said in his book called True Fellowship. In the daily life of the community, conducting our lives on a daily basis in close proximity to others guarantees that there will be tensions misunderstandings, individual quirks. How many are quirky? If if you don't know, ask your wife. (laughs) Struggles and differences of opinion. Our disrespect for one another, our innate selfishness and insidious self-justifications are all revealed. You say amen or say oh me. It's a painful but necessary revelation of our hearts. Like, we even have different flavors of prayer, don't we? Oh, we're a house of prayer people, so we do harp and bowl. What's wrong with you? Like, you're a little bit lower, aren't you? All you machine gun tongues out there. <laughs> don't you know you can sing and fly? I get it. Is, is that a litmus test? I'm just asking. There, there's lots of things we could put out there. I love it all. I think there's beauty in all of it. But where it goes wrong is if we demand it. Oh, we can't pray with you because you don't do it the way we prefer you to do it. Why? Do what? We can't pray together because you don't do it the way that I like it? For real? Tell it to the judge. (laughs) Continuing with this edgy quote. (laughs) Do not measure your love for God by your rapturous euphoria in an imagined relationship with the Lord that has been stimulated by choruses and worship. That would be a deception. Our supposed love for God is tested to the full by how much love we show for the brethren. In the wisdom and genius of God, we are saved from insisting that we can enjoy an exclusive relationship with God while at the same time living separated from our brothers and sisters. 
Come on, Lone Rangers, you're out of bounds. The Lord never allowed you to be a Lone Ranger in the body of Christ. You cannot be. You can never grow up into the stature of Christ being a Lone Ranger. You might think that you have a lot of followers on social media who think that you're awesome. But if you're separated from the body and you're not building into what Jesus is building because there's only one thing he said he was building and that is the church. If we're not building into that, by building into relationships, then he's not okay with our hyper-spirituality. If we cannot endure a seeming rejection, or if we find ourselves reacting in a touchy and hypersensitive manner, how then are we going to be overcomers in the crisis of the crisis time of the last days when the wrath and powers of darkness will be ventilated against God's people in a concentrated way? Kind of what you were pointing out. How, how are we going to do that? If we get irritated with each other because we're different... Because you like to pray different than me or you like to worship different than me. Or you don't believe my theology of end times or of election. But we can't really love each other then. Right? No. Y'all. the Lord Jesus is saying it's time to grow up and to be a mature body and learn how to walk free from offense especially over little things and to learn how to love well a good definition here's here's the last paragraph of this quote this is worth having. I could put this on a, on a poster on my wall and, and like it. A good definition of much of present Christendom is that it wants the sense of the power and gifts of God, but without the cross of God. If we have protective, little self-centered egos underlying an outward appearance of spirituality, we will find ourselves constantly hurt, But better to recognize that now and submit to the sanctifying work of God in an environment of true fellowship where we can get well. Such a good quote. So good. All right, so let me talk about three enemies of oneness that we deal with. Number one. these, These are enemies that we have to overcome because these are ways that Satan tries to get in and stifle the amazing power that God has placed upon and in his people in community. Romans chapter 14, and this is number one. Measuring you by my convictions and opinions. Measuring you by my convictions and opinions. Romans 14, this is an amazing thing. You know, you would kind of think that what Paul would do and the other writers in the New Testament letters would do is to say, no, here's, here's all the right things. This whole side is the right thing. Those whole side is the wrong things. But here's the reality of it. As far as opinions and convictions and some of these things, there's not a right or wrong thing. It's what you have inner conviction from the Holy Spirit about. And I can't tell you, you're wrong because you need to have the same conviction that I have. That creates division, and the Lord's not for it. Romans 14, we're going to read verses 1 through 10 and notice, um, and a couple other verses as well. But let's start at verse 1 of Romans 14. Now accept or receive or embrace the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment upon his opinions. So we're not allowed to pass judgment on opinions. We're not talking about sin. We're not talking about things that are blatantly in rebellion against God. That's a different category. But we're talking about opinions, whether you're going to wear a yarmulke or not. Whether you are only going to do harp and bowl or not. 
This is what we're talking about. One person has faith that he may eat all things. And in here, he's talking about a lot of the Jewish um, rituals. Because, again, you have people that they were steeped from the time they were born in a Jewish home. You only eat kosher. You never touch a dead person. You never touch a dead animal. You never do these things. You don't do them. They're unclean. And now they're having to get rewired. And so they're struggling. And Paul said, it's really okay if they want to do this for themselves. The line gets crossed when you say you should on these things. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. I'm moving towards weakness after my heart surgery, I can tell you. Um, Just a joke. No, I still eat meat, but not as much as I would. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt. Notice that word. Contempt. The one who does not eat. Here's the thing. It can become personal. It can become personal when you're talking about your own convictions and opinions with somebody else. Treat them with contempt. So stupid. That's just dumb. This is a big deal to the Lord. Look at verse 4. This is the question from heaven. Who are you? Who are you? To judge the servant of another. To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Who are you? Like, that's a question James asked too. The the Lord has asked me that before. When I had a heart issue with somebody that had, I felt like had seriously offended me and and done damage to me, and I was struggling with forgiveness. And, and, and here's what happens. We begin to impose or to presume that we know what their heart motive was, and we don't. That's sinful. That's sinful. When you presume they did that because you don't know that, only the heart knower knows that. And so we have no right to judge based on what we suppose their motive was. We can judge their action, but we can't judge their motive. If we judge motives, we'll never be one. You don't know why somebody did what they did. You don't know. Maybe if they tell you, you know. But you cannot presume that you know that. How often is this an issue in marriage? Should I have even gone there? It's so often an issue. Why'd you look at me that way? Like, my stomach was hurting, okay? (laughs) (laughs) Who are you to judge the servant of another? Verse 5, one person regards one day above another. Keep the Sabbath, keep the feasts. Great. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. So these are some of the areas where it's not a, quote, right or wrong. It's a matter of personal conviction. And I've studied the feasts of Israel and, and their holy days and all of that, and I think it's really cool. And one of the greatest, when I went to Israel, the greatest Um, part of that to me was being at the Western Wall when they were celebrating their Independence Day and dancing to the music. I was just, that was euphoric to me, seeing all the Jewish people out there dancing around celebrating their independence as a nation. I think it's beautiful. But for me, I don't keep the feasts. I don't keep the Jewish holidays. I think they're cool. I know people who love it and will go out there and build a little tent and the Feast of Tabernacles and camp out there. And, right? I mean, I got cured of camping a long time ago. I can just tell you. I'm, I'm more of an Airbnb guy. And um, I, I, I did my share of being outside and suffering for, for a lot of decades. And it's all good. But, like, I'm not a camper. Um, we had some really terrible, um, hurtful experiences in camping with our kids. And uh, not really hurtful, but uh, I don't know what to tell you. Raccoons stole all our food that we had for the next morning and dragged it out and ate every single stinking thing out of it. How can squirrels get metal tops off of peanut jars? But they did it. And they ate every stinking thing in there. You can ask my wife. Um, it's incredible. So, 
and then mosquitoes and walking a half a mile to get the bathroom and all that. So just saying, um, <laughs> probably won't get me to come to Feast of Tabernacles and sleep out in your little tent with, with you. Um, but that's my opinion. <laughs> Six, he who observes the day observes it for the Lord. This is really true. They, I, we had a, such a good friend, and, and she loved to do the feast, especially the Feast of Tabernacles. And we'd go out there, and they would have this whole thing that would be last all week, and they would do all this stuff. And we were, I was thinking to myself, wow, that's amazing. I think that's really cool. That it blesses you, but like, I'm not in. Um, but, but it's cool. They do it as unto the Lord, and it's great. For he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For no one of us, here, here's, here's the key, verse 7 and 8. No one of us lives for himself and no one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. This is the key understanding. We're not the judge of the servant of another. For to this end, Christ Jesus died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the living, the dead and the living. But look, look at verse 10. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? There's that word. It's making it personal. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. What does that tell you? I want to tell you something. What that says is that, Love will be on the final exam. And the way that we treat our brothers and sisters, we are going to get tested on that when we stand before Jesus. He's going to ask, I don't care about all the other stuff right now, but how did you love and did you love well? And did the way that you treated brothers and sisters demonstrate what I died for to make peace between the warring factions and to demonstrate the power that I did? executed on the cross to make human hearts brand new. He's going to ask that at the judgment seat. He just said that there. Verse 15 of the same chapter and then verse 19. And then we'll move on to point two. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. This is just really strong language. And verse 19, so then we pursue. It's really a commandment. So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and for the building up of one another. That's what we're supposed to pursue. Our differences are not supposed to be the end of love, but the opportunity for love and the demonstration of love. I know we don't all like the same things. And Jesus said, it's okay. I'm glad you don't because I want you to grow up. I want you to grow up by learning to genuinely love those that are very different from you. Because that's going to glorify me because it's going to demonstrate to everybody my power to transform the innate selfishness of the human heart. That's what it means to have a new heart. Love will be on the final exam. Signs and wonders will not be on the final exam. Do I want more signs and wonders? Yes, 100%. Will they be on the final exam? I do not believe so. Matthew chapter 7 makes that pretty clear, I think. Many will say to me in that day, many, many, not a few, many will say to me in that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons, and do many mighty works in your name? And my friends, I do not believe it's possible to lie in the face of perfect light who knows everything. I don't believe it. That would be a, an effort in fu- foolishness and futility. Nobody's going to lie to Jesus face to face. He doesn't deny that they did it. He just says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. 
How can that be? I don't know, but it's terrifying. But it tells me I want to focus on the main thing. I'm in no wise a cessationist. I'm all for the flow and the flood of spiritual gifts. And I believe the tide is rising and the Lord is doing more in this line. And that's why we need to hear this. Because the quirkiness of other people, even in the exercise of spiritual gifts, irritates some people. And the Lord wants us to love and to embrace and to show that we're more mature than that. Are you guys hanging in there all right? All right I, I've got to get this out or it's going to come out next time. All right, number two. This is a hindrance that we have to overcome. And I call it seeing through a rejection lens. Seeing through a rejection lens. What do I mean by that? Here's the paradox. The Corinthian church was the most revival hub church in the New Testament. They had all of the fivefold ministry gifts there. They were rejoicing in Paul, in Apollos, in Peter. A lot of scholars believe that Peter must have gone to Corinth and ministered there, even though we don't have record of it in Acts, because how else would there be a following there that was just passionate about Peter, 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 Peter? And Paul said, don't you know that all of that kind of boasting is carnal? It's not spiritual. You're not hyper-spiritual. But in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, he says, you come behind in no spiritual gift. And you're filled with all spiritual knowledge like they had all of this spiritual knowledge. And they were in some level were hyper-spiritual. And yet he said they were still babes. How is that possible? Because the measure of maturity is never spiritual gifts and manifestations. It's always love and character. Here's some characteristics of a rejection lens. Unresolved lingering hurts and scars from the past. Overly sensitive to perceived criticism. Stab themselves with stray arrows. What do I mean by that? Something said across the room and you'll take that thing and go, oh, they hurt and wounded me. It wasn't even for you. It's just a stray comment out there and you grab it and stab yourself with it. What are you doing? Don't do that. That's grabbing the stray arrows. This happens all the time. It really does. Unable to overlook an offense. Proverbs 19.11. Should be a memory verse for all of us. It's the glory of a man to overlook an offense. Nurture offenses. Keep feeding in the mind why they did that. Ascribing evil motives to other people's actions. Like we can't, folks... This would cure so many issues relationally if we would stop sinfully judging the motives of other people. We do not know. And we have no right to judge motives. Another characteristic of the rejection lens assumes wrong and hurtful motives. Slow to pursue understanding and reconciliation. Matthew 5, 24 says... If you're at the altar offering your gift and you remember that your brother has something against you, what's the next word? Go! Matthew 18. If you see that your brother has sinned against you, what's the next word? Go! So whether they have offense against you or you have offense against them, the command is go. Go and resolve it. Go and reconcile it. Go and make sure that everything's okay. It's not always done. We need to. Amen. (laughs) here's, Here's the last point that I have for the rejection lens. They expect rejection and so they attract it. I want to read 
just a couple of verses from 1 Corinthians 13 that you're very familiar with if you've ever been to a Christian wedding. <laughs> this is out of the Amplified Bible, um, which I like on this passage very much. I'm just going to read a few verses here, verses 4 through 7 maybe. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious or boils over with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. It's not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It's not rude, does not act unbecomingly. God's love in us does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it's not self-seeking. It's not touchy. It's not fretful. It's not resentful. It takes no account to evil done to it. it. Pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Now, a lot of times we could do that if we weren't hypersensitive. But even if there's a real offense, what, what are we supposed to do? Go. All right? And resolve it. This is the command of the Lord. Like, Keeping peace inside of relationship, inside of community is something Jesus died for. And we have to take that. This is weighty. It's serious. Number three point of things that we have to make sure that we keep the door shut is losing sight of mercy. Losing sight of mercy. I want to just read a few verses out of Luke chapter 6. Verses 35 to 38. And I want to ask us what our DNA is. Verse 35 of Luke 6. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. This is going to show your DNA. He's asking that if we really have the DNA of the Father. Because if we do, this is what we'll do. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Dude, that's a mouthful. Your father is kind to ungrateful. Like he gives them food and blessing and family and marriage and beaches and mountains and air conditioning and all of these things. And their whole life, they don't ever say, thank you, God. They're like, I got this for myself and I should have better. He's kind to those people because he doesn't make their AC shut off and he doesn't take their food away and he doesn't take their beach away. He's kind to them. But it also says to evil. And the the Greek word evil, there's poneros, and that is the name for the evil one. Evil people that are bent on doing evil, he's still kind to them. And he's asking Are you sons of your father? Do you show mercy and kindness when it's completely undeserved? Losing sight of mercy. We are all desperate for mercy. Can you testify? Can you testify that you're desperate for God's mercy every day? Yes. If we are desperate for his mercy, then we should give his mercy. Because James says in his book that the one who shows judgment without mercy will receive judgment without mercy. That's super weighty. I want to give you, I want to read you this verse that you're very familiar with out of 1 Corinthians 13 again. By the way, in 1 Corinthians 13, um, they're all, there's verbs all through there. I was reading just about this passage and the ones that I just read in 4 through 7 there. And I'll just read you this quote from New Testament scholar David Garland. Paul does not use adjectives to describe love, but verbs. Fifteen times in three verses, love is described by action. Love is dynamic and active, not something static. He's not talking about some inner feeling or emotion. Love is not conveyed by words. It has to be shown. It can be defined only by what it does and does not do. Unlike other loves of the world, which can remain hidden in the heart, it is essential to agape 
to manifest itself, to demonstrate itself, to provide proofs, and to put itself on display, so much so that in the New Testament it would be necessary to translate agape as the demonstration of love. Each thing that love does is something in which the ego does not dominate. And each thing that love does not do is something in which the ego does dominate. See what he's talking about there is not doing your own thing, but doing his thing and choosing what is best for the other person. Last verse in 1 Corinthians 13. But now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these Come on. The greatest of these is love. Like we, we actually need to confess this as charismatics. We do. Because we exalt and magnify faith as we should. We exalt and magnify the miraculous as we should. We exalt and magnify the gifts of the Spirit as we should. But the greatest of these, the most weighty, the most valuable Is love. And if we don't have that, then we're missing the greatest value. I know we don't like to hear it. I know cessationists like to quote 1 Corinthians 13. It's all about love and not about gifts. No. It's about both being together, merged and locked together. Can we walk that way with faith and with trust in God and with bold, courageous outreach to the Lord for miraculous things to happen. But can we do that with genuine love where we are preaching peace at the same time? That I'm going to sacrifice my own opinions, my own preferences for the sake of our relationship. It's too important. Jesus died for our oneness and I won't sacrifice that for anything. In this passage in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, He talks about being a martyr. If I give my body to be burned, if I give away all of my possessions, extravagant generosity, if I have all knowledge and all faith, the most accurate words of knowledge and gifts of power, the most powerful jaw-dropping miracles, if I have all of these things, but I don't have love as the core, I am Say it. Nothing. Nothing. That's really powerful. He didn't say you were only 50%. He said you're nothing. Because if love isn't what flavors everything we do, it's a fail. And why does he say love is the greatest? Between faith and hope and love. Because y'all... Faith and hope are going to be defined differently when we're in eternity. Because right now, faith is largely defined as trusting God for what we can't see. But when we're face to face, we'll see everything and know everything. And hope, there's still going to be the trust in God. There's still going to be the anticipation of God doing great things. But faith and hope as they are now are going to be changed. But love will endure forever. It will define all of our relationships. It will define our eternity with God and with each other. And so we need to prioritize it now as well. Seven quick reasons why love is the greatest. Number one, because God said it is. Number two, because it reflects the very nature of God. God is love. Number three, it's the goal of the gospel. Paul said the goal of our instruction is love with a true and sincere faith and a clean conscience. It is the evidence of new life. You know that you've passed from death to life because you love the brothers, 1 John 3, 14 says. Number five, it is the testimony of true discipleship. By this will all people know that you're my disciples. Because you have powerful Holy Ghost meetings. No. Because you love each other. And that's the demonstration of the greatest miracle that's ever happened. The human heart being transformed. 
Number six, it is the fulfilling of God's law and requirement for us. Love is the fulfilling of the law. You can't say that about faith or hope. They're powerful and important, but they're not the fulfilling of the law. And then number seven, why is love the greatest? It will be on the final exam. It will be on the final exam for every one of us here. Now, Wody, will you come up here for me? I can pick on Wody because I know he won't get mad at me. He is way bigger than me, but he also knows I'm way older than him. <laughs> so he'd be gentle. Can you turn this one on for me? All right, brother. Okay. I want you to tell these people what I got here. Y'all see what this is? Tell them what it is. Bread, cake, money. <laughs> Translation, money. Right, tell, tell, tell them what it is specifically. A uh, $20 bill, a $10 bill, and a $5 bill. Okay. Which one of these is the greatest? The $20 bill. The $20 bill is the greatest? Yeah. Okay. But would you throw away the 10 and the 5 if I give you this sheet? No. Why not? They're still valuable. They're valuable. They're not the greatest, but we need them. They're valuable. Now, how many believe that Well, you should take Lisa out for lunch with this money right here? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Keep your opinion to yourself. <clears throat> Y'all, the Lord is calling us higher. And I want to tell you something for real. As the water keeps rising, as the Lord keeps doing more, as there's more stirring of the Holy Spirit, it is more incredibly important for us to walk and to live in love Amen. with each other. Because the enemy will come in on any little thing. I could tell you lots of stories in revival history. That's one of my favorite things to do over the last 15, 20 years to study revival history. I can tell you how almost every single one of them failed because love deteriorated and failed. That's true of Azusa Street. That's true of Brownsville. That's true of any revival you want to name. It really is. And I can tell you the details of it. It's heartbreaking, but there wasn't enough relational equity to hold it together when the tension came and the whole thing fell apart. It happens over and over and over again. I don't know what all the Lord wants to do in this place, but I know it's a lot more than what we've seen. But as we move forward, we have to navigate and value love the way the Father does. I'm going to love you deeply. I'm going to lay down my own preferences and opinions. I'm not going to insist that you be like me so we can fellowship together. That's nauseating. The Lord loves diversity, and He wants us to love it. He wants us to appreciate the qualities and the deposit that he's put in each one of us that are sitting around us. And as we move forward, you can be sure there's going to be irritations. There's going to be things where you're tempted to say, that wasn't right. That wasn't God. And the, the voice from heaven, if you're listening, is going to say, who are you to judge the servant of another? Who are you anyway? And we're going to have to say, Lord, I defer to love. I defer to your character and your nature. I defer to mercy. I lay down my preferences. I lay down my opinions for the sake of love and oneness. And I purpose to be one who demonstrates your glory by showing that my heart has been changed enough to love people that are very different from me and that are very quirky and that I don't relate to on very many levels. But to actually lay down my life for them. And look, love is defined in Scripture as sacrificial, right? We know love by this because it feels so good. No, it's not what it says. We know love by this, that Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought also lay down our lives for each other. That's what it says. And so that means if we're going to walk in love, we're going to have to die to a lot of things. And one of them is our stinking opinion. I'm so thankful for the times in my life where the Lord humbled me and spoke to me about how proud I was. 
because of my own opinions. It's a joke. We all see in part and know in part. We're looking through a glass darkly still. But in our navigation, we have to walk in a way that pleases the Lord and be a people of genuine, not with tongue, with action of love. God, help us. I'm going to pray for us. Father, would you make us a people of love? Would you get down to all of those issues that have blinded us? Would you permeate to the depths of our heart and soul and cleanse us from the hindrances that would be a stumbling block that the enemy would be able to use to cause offense and division? Would you help us, God, to be a humble and a gentle people, to be a people that show your DNA where we show mercy, where we don't demand justice for ourselves, where we lay that down at the foot of the cross? Would you help us to be the people that can be the wineskin to contain what you want to pour out in this community? Help us, God. Help us to be one because that's what you died for. Thank you, Lord, for your continued faithfulness in dealing with us in our hearts and souls, causing us to be Christ-like, causing us to walk in the way that honors you and glorifies your name. In Jesus' name.